All right, here we go, folks. We are here with the Wood Slicer 9000, as I like to call it, uh, our homemade sawmill. And I want to bring you guys an introduction, uh, details, uh, everything I can about it uh, for those who might be thinking about building one for themselves. Um, just, yeah, breakdown, size, capacity, all that good stuff. So stay tuned. All right, what we have here is our homemade sawmill. And overall dimensions, we got 20 foot rails. And how wide is the bunks, Dad? How wide is this? 30 inches. Uh, 30 inches wide. I think you can cut a 32 inch log, possibly even more. Really gonna determine between the distance between your guides. All right, let's start with the foundation. Uh, basically, we came up with some eight inch concrete blocks, piers, uh, made little forms. That way we can come in with adjustable legs and get our height perfectly level, lasered out perfectly level. Uh, the main rails are four by three quarter inch steel, 20 foot long, uh, 16 foot maximum log capacity. Uh, that's all we, we figured we'd ever need. And uh, really, um, there's no need to go over that. So our guide rollers roll on our angle, which is flipped upside down. What'd you say it was, Dad? One and a quarter by three sixteenths thick. One and a quarter by three sixteenths thick flipped with the open side down, welded, and that way our guide rollers can run on. I actually took a scraper off. Dad made a scraper. Where's your scraper at? We actually have a scraper that rides on here, and it keeps the schmutz off the track, which is a good idea if you're gonna have any kind of a steel roller like that roll on a track in case of wood or like sawdust any kind of debris or something you definitely want that coming off all right our bunks are two by two three sixteenth inch square tubing uh everything i'm going to be describing in, in dimensions is going to be imperial because we are in the usa and i don't know the metric equivalents and yeah i'm just not going to do that uh, we also have two inch angle is welded into a c channel with a support in the center that our bunk rides on. And those are spaced how far apart? Approximately three feet. Uh, they're spaced evenly in between. Obviously at the front where your carriage rides, you can't get all the way up. So there's no point in, you know, they're skewed more one way. Um, we have our adjustable guides or stops, I should say. We have an offset with a roller so we can roll the log over. And then we also have square just for like cants, uh, squared up cants and stuff to screw against. All right, our log clamp riding on three quarter inch steel tube uh, hollowed out. And what it does is it binds as you slide it over and then you have a threaded T handle made out of all thread. Uh, to dig into the log to hold it when you're doing your first initial cuts and also basically just hold the log down. Our carriage depth is 29 inches. Our overall height from the rollers all the way to the very top to our highest uh, pulley up here is, what'd you say? 82. 82 inches. And our width from edge here to the other edge is 43 inches the power that drives this puppy is a 27 horsepower Kohler v-twin uh, commercial engine plan on spending probably 2600 plus if you want to buy one of these engines uh, they are really 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 solid um, our little tractor you've seen in the other videos if you check out my other videos um, it has a 25 horse Kohler v-twin and that thing's got a gazillion hours and it still runs strong so uh if you're going to put the investment in, I would definitely go with a Kohler. Um, if not, you can use just about anything. Um, old four-wheeler engine, something like that. Uh, really depends on the horsepower that you need. Um, for our application, it definitely required 25 plus horsepower. So, uh, Main construction for the carriage is a two by two steel tubing. I'll show you guys how we did it. What thickness, what wall thickness is that, Pop? Eleven gauge. Yeah. It's about eighth inch. Yeah, close to eighth inch. Close to eighth inch. 
And then we have our riser for our pulleys and stuff. Battery tray. Fuel tray. Basically brackets just bolted to the main carriage system. Uh, do recommend angle for stability. And then water for your lubrication. Uh, some people don't use lubrication. If you're gonna cut sappy wood, I would definitely recommend lubrication. We use soap water um, because we have band wheels that have a rubber insert for the blade to ride on. Uh, I would not use kerosene or diesel fuel, although that works really, really well. It probably will break down your belts pretty rapidly. So, next on the order, up and down mechanism. Simple pulley, V-groove with a piece of belt. You have your stop, let tension off, head comes down, and roll it back up. You wanna give a demonstration pop? Push forward and go up. That holds it. It holds it. And then you can let off and come down. I wouldn't recommend not holding that. <laughs> you could, but uh, yeah, you can see. Not a good idea. You want to put your hand on it. <laughs> uh, we took the uh, height indicator is a piece of uh, T-square for like drywall. Um, that hacked that up and we have a guide attached to our chain. It can be adjustable. Anytime you adjust your blade, you need to readjust your height indicator because the distance between your blade and your bunk is going to change, could change. And you should always double check that before you start. Uh, something we learned along the way. Yeah, so there's a whole lot of gearing going on in here for your up and down mechanism. Why is it gear like that? Just to get the gearing right, Dad? Yeah, so we'll be able to lift it. Oh, so we'll be able to lift it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could because it's so heavy. Yes, it is a heavy head. Uh, give you guys a close up on the gearing. That's the back side of our pulley. You see small there, large up there, which multiplies the torque that you're applying to it. Number 40 chain. Number 40 chain? Yeah. Okay, number 40 chain. That's pretty much, that's what you're using all this, isn't it? No, that's 41 down there. 40? It's not quite as wide. Okay, so 40 chain. And we see up here, pulley, you got a jack shaft that comes over and lifts the other side. What kind of tube is this? It's just a heavy wall steel tubing. Heavy wall steel tubing. You got a scrubber on there. Dad put on there to scrub off all the debris because you don't want it going down inside your slip tube here that rides up and down the whole carriage rides up and down on um as a guide to keep everything in line oh yeah the chain for the drive what you side you say that was 41. 41 okay so you know your little uh, electric scooters like your hover rounds and the stuff you see the old folks riding on wheeling around on that's what that came out of pop found this where'd you find it on ebay ebay you found it on ebay how many you got two of them yeah, I've got, I got a spare. You got a spare. Definitely, if you're going to do one, get a spare. Uh, this thing's got a lot of torque. So you can't actually increase the speed right now. It's geared down. We have it geared down pretty low. But uh, you got your main sh drag shaft that drives both sides. You got a feed down here and a feed here. Down to your chain system. Around a pulley, which is tied at either end with a threaded rod to adjust tension. As you can see, and then that one feeds all the way out both sides. Why we have a chain drive on both sides, Pop brought up the point that because of the weight and if you pull it on one side, you could cause it to come out of alignment, drawing hard from one side because you got a load from your saw head. So it just made sense to drive both sides. You got equal pull, they can be adjusted. Like I showed you the threaded rod. Um, it's been adjusted to where it rides and tracks straight. Uh, no problem with it riding up either way like that right there. Eliminates less issues when it comes to driving your blade through your wood. Also on a side story, so about the torque on this thing right here, uh, Pop told me that uh, he ran it all the way to the end and what would you say? The fuse didn't blow? Uh, yeah, it, it stalled and didn't blow the fuse but it snapped the chain. It stalled. <laughs> The, the carriage head hit the end of the track, stalled, it didn't blow the fuse like it should have, and it actually broke the chain. That's how much power these things, the way it's geared, can do. 
And uh, I'll give you a demonstration in just a second, forward and backwards, and how that works. All right, we got our control box. Where's your key at? I'm gonna show these folks a special key. We got a really special key. Look at that. A fat, stubby flathead. <laughs> there you go. Don't need it, it's already unlocked. All right, we have a control box here that Pop built. I can't tell you anything that goes on in the electronics in here, but I can tell you we have a forward and reverse. And then we have a speed for forward. And conveniently, we're missing the knob for speed for reverse, which is cranked full tilt. So when it backs up, it drives full tilt. And then forward, and you can adjust the speed. Give you guys an idea how it drives. drive mechanism how it picks up let's see if I can do this without killing myself here we go just riding off a jack shaft all right and in the event that power runs out we do have a manual override right here and now you can push the carriage forward by hand which is not particularly light because it is heavy but it can be done that way, which we don't have an outrigger arm to push on it just because we haven't had to do that yet. So, what is this, you ask? You're about to find out. All right, next stop. So we, it's the magnet we can set anywhere we want. So, if we were cutting and we wanted to, that's the end of our log. Drive it into it. So, we're cutting, cutting, cutting. cutting. Basically, it's for single man operation. And also as a safety mechanism too. See your sensor coming up. Oh, we're dead. We're stopped. And you can adjust that stop so that you reach the end of the log, it'll automatically quit moving. And we have one for each side. You got your sensor here, it's a magnetic sensor. And we got our other one on the other side, front and back. You should always have one going forward and backwards. That kind of ties in together with the whole emergency stop thing. Um, just as a safety, really and truly, we're probably gonna come back and put another uh, override in case somehow it overruns this. When it gets to the very end, have a, a full kill uh, tied into it. I think that's another safety thing we're gonna add in, just, just to be safe. Yes, I keep using that same word over and over again because these things can kill you real easily if you're an idiot like we are, so. All right, back to controls. I, I am not the electronics guy by no means. Uh, you don't have to have all this jazzed up stuff to drive your sawmill but dad being the crafty man he is he's <laughs> you got to do it I, I i guess it's better than pushing it right you know having to drive and stuff but uh anywho you want to flick your switch dad this is a bypass bypass that means you don't have to have a key or motor running to be able to run with yeah gotcha and that's for the laser down there for the laser and we'll get to that in a minute okay. and then that's just your that's your potentiometer basically for the drive right yeah. right speed that's, drive. Your, that's your forward that's your reverse okay so turn your turn your switch yeah, off now turn the key of the motor the ignition key on the ignition key that tells your keys on keys on that means your oil there's oil pressure because the motor's not running no oil pressure because the motor's not running as soon as the motor starts up that will go out if you're ever running it and that becomes red that's bad well, juju <laughs> oh, it does have an oil pressure yeah, sensor? Yeah, okay. sensor. That's what it's for. Oh, that's right. That's right. What am I thinking? Well, all your modern stuff and probably has it. Just the, the voltage, the battery voltage. Oh, battery voltage indicator. Uh, so we know. Uh, there is a generator on the actual motor that powers our 12-volt 12 12 volt battery over there. Um, so, yeah. That's basically it without going into the actual super nitty-gritty details. All right, we have an emergency stop right here in case somebody does something really stupid, like, I don't know, backs it up with it still engaged in the log mm -hmm. and pulls the blade off. <laughs> I'm just saying that. I'm just saying that. Hit that your was, hit your emergency that, stop. That kills the motor and the drive. It oh, that kills... Everything. Okay, this kills motor and drive. This kills everything. Like, we want it dead, dead, like, in case something bad happens. So, that is a good thing. All right. That's something you don't see anybody doing. 
No, and I would re- I would recommend that if you have it electronically driven, any kind of drive, ha- have a cutoff on it. I mean, a really accessible cutoff. If you're going to be operating from this side, have it in arm's length. Um, it really be nice to have one on the other side too, but there shouldn't be nobody on that side over there anyways. Uh, motor drive. How do we engage the motor? So you got a clutching mechanism over there with the, with the idler rubber. Uh-huh. So we engage the mechanism. How's the mechanism work here? Pull this lever up. Lever up. All right, bring the lever back down. Okay, lever up. Okay, we got an idler pulley that tightens the belt, which is just floating on the pulleys, the dry pulley. And let's see, jack shaft. You can probably see it better from the back side. Probably from the back side. All right, and how you engage the motor to drive the belts. We got a lever, lever pulls over here. We got a cam basically with an idler pulley that pushes the belts, basically takes up the slack in the belts and makes them bite into the dry pulley on the engine up here and spins your blade around, yay. Also, we got a throttle control. When you disengage the blade, it throws the brings the engine idle down. The governor doesn't work quite like we would like it to work. Um, kind of finicky, so we just did our own override that therefore we can keep it from over revving when you get through the end of a log and the load disappears uh, sometimes it can over rev for the uh, governor kicks back in all right now to the business part of this pull that open dead all right what we have here is an inch and a quarter this is a seven degree tooth angle. Yeah, seven, degree. seven degree tooth angle. Recommended for hardwoods, hard materials. Uh, 10 degree, you can use on like pines and stuff. And then there's also other specialty blades you can buy. Um, these are just general, I think these are wood miser blades. Um, yes. They work really well. We got 19 inch band wheels. What size is the shaft these things riding on, Dad? One and a half, One and a half inch. And I'll show you the pillow blocks and bearing assemblies whenever we get down. We have our drive wheel. Remember we were talking about the mechanism, the idler pulley that engages to actually drive. Drive pulley in the back. Yeah. Notice your belt doesn't spin when that spins. That's because it's slack. Guys, very, very important. These right here were purchased from Cook's Saw Manufacturing in Alabama. Um, Good products. They have adjustable height up and down, so you can make sure your blade is parallel with your bunk. You should always ride parallel. And also that the adjustments back here for your guide to get the tilt just right so that you don't dive into the wood and dive down or, you know, dig up. This is where our water comes in, our lubrication for our blade. And there's nothing come through it right now, obviously, because we're not running it, so... But basically, blade goes this way, drive wheel. Squirt your lube on here, keeps everything lubed up. Helps keep the pine resin or resins, uh, saps, all that stuff off. Helps keep it off your rubber wheel or your steel wheel, whichever one you're driving with. I think Cooks uses steel wheels. Um, these are rubber wheels just because it's inexpensive. All right, discharge chute backside. Sawdust comes out here primarily. Uh, as you can see over here, we got our sawdust. Some of that's powdery from running too fast, I guess you'd say. Anywho, we got our pillow blocks, our inch and a half shaft. We actually made an assembly to put the blocks on. Uh, what we noticed at first is when you tension this up, it takes a tremendous amount of tension, it actually moved one of these blocks and pulled the wheel out of alignment. And that made for uh, bad tracking and Blad ba- uh, blade bad blade travel holy crap I cannot talk your bearing assembly bolts through the top these are actually a little bit loose so that we can adjust the wheel angle you want them slightly out so when you tension it it pulls them back in a perfect line opposite our drive side and you can see our pillow blocks we made an assembly for the pillow blocks to ride on. You want to make sure you lock these suckers in because if you don't, when you go to tension it, it's going to move. It's going to cause you all kinds of problems. Then you're going to be chasing your tail wondering what the heck's going on. So, We have adjustment screws for our assembly that rides on top of our 
main uh, what the heck do you call that carriage frame. carriage frame there you go carriage frame all right you have threaded rod pulling the shaft itself the shaft assembly itself back we do have a spring in there for tension uh was that 750 800 pounds uh that is not enough it takes a lot more than that really you need two of them running in parallel it takes about 1600 uh pounds of force to put enough tension on these blades they want like 16 to 17 thousand psi uh tensile whatever that jazz means um Basically, you want to stretch the blade, and the tighter you can get it, the faster you can run it, but also the quicker it wears the blade out. So, what we found is we actually bring it into what's pretty much coil bind. We go by a torque torque setting that we found that works for us. And keep in mind, the tighter you make it, the more it's going to pull the wheels, and the more your blade's going to try to travel off those off those guides. So, I'm sure anybody that has done this knows exactly what I'm talking about. So that hints why you keep your wheel slightly co uh, cocked out tighten it up it brings it back in and it tracks where you want it to track um, our blade we run it about 3 16 off the back of the guide so as you get into cut it pulls the blade back that way it doesn't ride constantly on the guide and prematurely wear out the back of your blade because you can always resharpen these something we haven't done yet one final note if you guys remember the video the previous video i'll try to put a link in it somewhere here there there i don't know somewhere uh, where we cut our beams you could see the laser in action and the whole purpose of the laser yeah you can see, okay there you go you see on the wall what that does is all it is is for when you put a log on here and you have a tapered in almost all logs have a taper skinny in you always want to cut the skinny end to this end so you know what all wood you can get uh, i think that's a general good idea and most of the sawmill videos i've seen people recommend that i having done this having done this i would agree with them that is a wiser decision anyways so you have a taper say you have a log that has a real huge taper at the end well use the laser to guide it you can lift up one end with a jack support it underneath your bunk so that you get the most i guess the best cut you can get where you're cutting through evenly through your grain i don't know how to explain that without actually showing you guys an example but basically that's so you can level the log that the whole purpose of that is so you can level the log and you know where the blade is tracking to so that if your blade gets dull and when this blade gets dull when you're cutting through hardwood you'll be traveling along and all of a sudden poosh, dives down and it's over with you ain't gonna make no more cuts after that uh you pull it off put another blade on or resharpen it and we don't have the tools to resharpen yet i'm sure pop's gonna make a sharpener because that's what he does is make stuff and he don't have enough projects to do as it is now so but yeah that's pretty much it overall on our project We're sitting out here filming this video and Pops, <laughs> he's already <laughs> discussing how to power the head up and down. So yeah, that's just what we do. It's, it's always a constant work in progress. Uh, we've made improvements and we'll continue to make improvements on this. Uh, it works good for what it is now, but uh, yeah, like I said, Pops always up to something. He's done got another idea. Just filming this uh, little segment. <laughs> All right, folks, thank you for watching. I hope that this was informative uh, for anybody that has built one, maybe needs ideas on how to improve, or they themselves would you know, like to build one themselves. Uh, they themselves would like to build one. That would sound really intelligent. Um, yeah. I think Pop said we got about $2,500 in steel. Um, now, that was purchased before all the inflation and all that stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, it could be uglier than that. It's about a year. It's about a year old from when he purchased most of the items in here. Uh, I think all told, we're about eighty eighty five hundred dollars into this um, for a comparable mill, a thirty two inch wide cut with a twenty seven inch mo uh, motor on it. You're going to be looking at like fifteen thousand, probably uh, fifteen sixteen thousand, and there's going to be a couple month lead time easy to get one built, maybe even longer than that. So uh, you can see why I'd Pop decided to build it. Um, give him all the credit because he's the one that's done ninety nine point nine nine percent of all the work on it. And he generated that out of his head. So, yeah, not bad. And in, in inspiration from other people on YouTube. Uh, just like myself, I've watched lots and lots of sawmill videos. Um, I like to see how people can come up with creative ideas to make things, whether it's a chainsaw mill or bandsaw mill or circular. I really want a circular saw mill, but uh, them suckers are dangerous. <laughs> I'll probably get myself hurt on it. But uh, 
Guys, thanks for watching. Uh, please like, subscribe. If you have any questions about the construction, any details on this, uh, send a message, uh, leave a message. I'll be glad to respond. And uh, if I don't know the answer, I will certainly get it for you uh, from Pop. And uh, yeah, look forward to the next video where we're actually going to start making some lumber, rough on lumber for my porch.